So uh, first of all, I would love to um, uh, introduce David Lenga, who is um, Polish Jew, like me, a Holocaust survivor um, who lost his entire family members in the Holocaust, uh, who was deported to Auschwitz only when he was 17 year old. And he will tell us his story of survival. And it's an honor to have you here, David, uh, for me. Um, you know, I'm dedicating my entire life um, to investigate, to talk to Holocaust survivors and to spread the stories and the information to people who really don't know anything about it. I just wanna, before we start, just wanna thank uh, the American Society for Yad Vashem for supporting the crucial efforts of Yad Vashem, the, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem. And for more information, please visit their website page, Yad Vashem USA. Uh, David, before we start, you know, just last night, Jews were attacked in West Hollywood because they are Jews. And um, do we see that everywhere in the world. We see that in Europe, we see that in, in New York, we see that everywhere, including Israel. But uh, what is your first reaction to uh, this incident? Okay, so my reaction is visceral uh, in the sense that as of late, many progressive circles, both Jewish and non-Jewish, have been touting the idea that you can separate anti-Semitism from the issue of Israel. Well, it shows, it just goes to show again and again that you cannot. It is absolutely intertwined. No question about it. So when they were talking about anti-Israeli issues, they are talking about anti-Semitism, they're talking about anti-Jewishness, and they are acting upon that belief. This is what we see happening time and time again. And uh, what we have been witnessing here in Los Angeles is just a small expression of that feeling uh, by groups that are hell-bent on changing the narrative. And so they're attacking the Jewish people uh, as a matter of what they call solidarity with their brethren in, uh, in Israel uh, and in Gaza. And uh, uh, what we are witnessing is violence and um, we cannot tolerate that. The point is, the world at large, the non-Jewish world at large, cannot tolerate a Jewish state that is able and willing to defend their people and their country. They are not used to this. They are used to mourn the Jews after they die. They are used to send condolences after the people have been slaughtered. But while it is happening, while the slaughter is happening, Everybody was turning a blind eye and was, was deaf and, and blind and didn't want to see, didn't want to hear and let it happen. That is the true facts of the better. And anything that we're witnessing today is just a continuation of the same anti-Semitism. It, each generation, it seems to me, is uh, creating their own form of anti-Semitic expression. And um, in our own day, what we are seeing is that so-called progressive uh, circles, uh, whether Jewish or not, they are trying to change the narrative by telling the world that you cannot, that you can actually separate anti-Semitism from the Israeli issue. You cannot, you cannot, and that shows over and over again. And so this is what we are witnessing today. But I can tell you this, if Israel would have been existing prior to the Holocaust, the Holocaust would never happen. That is a fact of life. No doubt. And this is what Jewish people need to understand the world over and they have to take it to heart. Well, thank you. Thank you for this um, point of view. You know, I. I remember my grandfather 
speaking about the same things. And, you know, I think that our generation, my generation, we are the third um, generation of Holocaust survivors. I think this, it's our role to spread the stories and talk about what happened uh, because we will never forget and never forgive. So I want to, I want you to take us to, I think, 75 years earlier, right? Okay. Ago. Actually, yeah, okay. it is and 75 years. Yeah. Yeah, tell, us, tell us about your family in Poland, in Lodz, and, well. and <laughs> how it all started. Okay, so uh, for me, uh, I had a wonderful childhood to begin with. I was born into a very religious Jewish family at home in Poland, in Lodz, in the city of Lodz. Lodz was a vibrant city. 40% Jewish people lived there. So the Jews were uh, very much thriving in their own atmosphere, meaning that they have learned over the centuries how to adapt to being a persecuted and oppressed minority in a majority country. And that goes not only for Poland, but all over Europe, all over the world. Jews are by necessity a, a minority. And so as a minority, they are circumscribed by the majority, what they can and cannot do and what is expected. Of. You know, even though Jews were citizens of every country they lived in, whether it is France, Poland, or whatever, or Germany, they were never accepted as equal citizens, as equal citizens. They were tolerated at best, under the best of times. And Jews needed to adapt to this reality. And so they did by starting to rely on their own people, which means we, the Jewish people, the Jewish community was thriving only because of that fact that they were creating their own infrastructure. They were creating their own rabbinical courts. They were creating their own schools. They were creating their own organizations. They were relying on each other and they were uh, trying to look for solace and for comfort within the community. And so consequently, with this arrangement, the Jewish people were able to create a, a status quo or, or a status for themselves in Poland that I know of. And they were coexisting with the majority Christian population. That does not mean that anti-Semitism didn't exist. It did very, very much exist. And I've experienced it firsthand when I was a kid going out playing in the uh, on the courtyard with the non-Christian neighbors. Of course, we had many of those because they were the majority. And we were uh, interacting with each other in a beautiful way. And, uh, you know, we were laughing together, we were giggling together, we were having fun together. But uh, God forbid, if any Jewish boy or girl should say anything that displeased the non-Jewish children, right away anti-Semitism was spewed forth and we were accused of becoming parshivizhizhye which means scabby Jew. And we were a scabby Jew and we were all kinds of terrible things all of a sudden, out of, out of clear nowhere, because the anti-Semitic was seething underneath. This is what the children and the generations over and over again were fed by their parents, by their churches, by their priests. They were preaching anti-Jewishness. They were preaching that Jews are Christ killers. They were preaching that Jews have to be punished from generation to generation. This is what they were preaching, and this is what they knew. And so consequently, anti-Semitism never abated in Poland or the rest of Europe. That ultimately led to the Holocaust. Now, I'm not going to step by step how the Holocaust was caused or happened. We all know that history tells us about it. What I can tell you is this, growing up in Poland as a child, into a middle-class family because my father was a manufacturer. We had a tannery in a small town south of uh, the city of Lodz called Strykov. And my, did, my, my parents did well. I went on vacations with my parents as a kid. I had a younger brother. He was four years younger than me. And we had a wonderful life. We really did. We had beautiful friends. They were all Jewish, mostly. Uh, and, um, and all we knew is the good life. And then one day, the fateful day of September the 1st, 1939, I find myself on a streetcar going on an errand for my parents. 
I was at that time 11 years old in 1939. And on that streetcar, uh, within 15 minutes of the ride, everything stopped because the sirens of the city stopped blaring something very alarmingly. And all the adults around me knew what that meant. It meant danger. It meant an imminent attack is to be expected. So the, all the vehicles, the streetcars, the cars, everything stopped dead in its tracks. People were running out uh, from the vehicles and running into neighboring uh, houses uh, for shelter. Before we had a chance even to get out of this streetcar, we were attacked by an armada of German attack planes coming down low on the population and machine gunning everything and everybody inside. And before I knew what was happening, as an 11 year old boy, I was witnessing a river of blood in a slaughterhouse right in front of my eyes. People's body parts were flying every which way. People were dying. They were being killed from the air from the machine guns. And, and, wow. and panic wow. erupted and people were running for their lives into the neighboring uh, houses to look for shelter. And so did I. And eventually I found my way home after a long time because I didn't dare to go with the main streets. What if they attack again? And when I came home <laughs> in the middle of the day, the house in which I lived, the windows were shuttered in the middle of the day, unheard of. And the streets were almost empty of people. Everybody was huddling in their homes. When I came in, my dad was beside himself because he, he didn't know what happened to me physically, but he heard about the attack on the radio. He pulled me in and he asked me to tell him what I saw and I did. <coughs> and at that point, my dad became very somber. He sat me down, he sat down my brother and my mom and he told us in no uncertain terms, he says, listen, what just now happened, what we witnessed, is the beginning of the most ominous, darkest time in history for the Jewish people. Wow. We do oh, not yeah. know what is gonna to happen to us. We do not know what's gonna happen the next day, the next minute. <laughs> so we have to stick to each other for as long as we can and look for comfort within each other. And let, me, let, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question. So <laughs> stage, was it possible to get out of Poland for Jews and to immigrate to another country, or was it back then already impossible to do that? When, by, once Germany uh, attacked Poland, it was too late because they immediately entered Poland. They attacked Poland and they entered Poland with a tremendous force. They had the most mightiest military machine built up since World War I in the face of international condemnation that should have been much stronger than that, but they let it happen. And consequently, no one in Europe, not France, not England, not Poland or anywhere, even Russia, could withstand the awkward, the awesome military machine that Germany provided. And so consequently, when they attacked, Poland crumbled within two weeks, totally crumbled. And it was too late to escape at that time. But uh, one cousin of mine, my father's, my oldest, uh, my father's oldest brother, his oldest daughter was the one that was pleading with the parents before Hitler invaded, because there were ominous signs that something like that may happen. And she pleaded with them to please leave Poland, leave everything what you have, don't save your life and let's run away, let's go to Russia. But the Jews of Poland could not fathom what is going to happen. And they were very reluctant to leave their life's work, their factories, their homes, their beautiful existence, just leaving and run. I mean, where are we running? I mean, they couldn't visualize that, that what they're doing, if they do run, they save their own lives. And so consequently, they didn't. They were caught in the trap. Once Hitler attacked, it was too late to leave. Okay. My cousin, that pleaded with her parents to leave. She did leave with, with some friends of theirs. Uh, they were Zionists and they, and they were very uh, uh, you know, patriotic uh, Jews and they saw the danger and they took the liberty to leave. And they went to Russia and they've survived the war. The only one. 
that cousin that, that left Poland survived the war. Now, the parents, they, her parents did not, my parents did not, except my dad survived the war. But everybody else that I ever knew, we were like a hundred people in our family from both sides, mother and father's side, and all of them perished in the Holocaust. I survived and my father survived out of a hundred. David, a uh, hundred family members in Lodge? Yes. This is, this is a big tribe, Jewish tribe. In oh Lodge. my God, yes, we were a huge, huge family. Huge. The, the, uh, yeah, we had, were a huge family on both sides of, of our family, besides the mother's side and the father's side. My father had seven brothers and a sister, you know. Wow. <laughs> and they all had, they were all grown up and they what, were all, all had families. What was the family business? My family business, I mean, my father's family, my father was a, a manufacturer. I told you, we had a cannery in the city of Strykov, a, a small town, a Jewish town, actually, south uh, of, uh, I think it was south of, of Lodge, 18 kilometers, called Strykov. That's where we had a cannery. We were the biggest employer in town. And so consequently, my dad was doing well. And um, uh, we lived a wonderful life. Uh, but like I said, it didn't matter who you were or what kind of a status you you, you uh, occupied in, in society. Once Hitler came in, the pogrom started right away. They did the persecution of the Jews. They were <laughs> immediately, immediately, they were plastering the whole city uh, with signs uh, telling uh, the Jews that their civil rights have been totally uh, taken away from them. Okay, the Nuremberg laws gave them the legal right to take away the civil rights of the Jewish people. And so immediately I couldn't go to school anymore, neither did my brother. Immediately people couldn't get a job if they were, say, a teacher or a, a professor at the university or, or, or any kind of position that they held in Poland, they could no longer practice it as Jews. It was the livelihood was taken away from them. Okay people became totally dehumanized after a short time. And so consequently, they felt at liberty to put their ideology, Hitler's ideology of what he announced in Mein Kampf, in the book that he wrote, Mein Kampf, he announced exactly what he wants to do with the Jewish people. He wants to annihilate the Jewish people, okay? He wants an Aryan race, period. Everyone that is not Aryan is subhuman in their ideology. And so consequently, as uh, soon as they came in, they were rounding up the Jewish men, especially the men, uh, you know, randomly on the street. And they were putting placards on them, accusing them of crimes that they did not commit. And they hung them on gallows in, on many, many plazas in, in Lodz. And they were forcing the civilian Jews to stand and watch as a form of intimidation and to cow the people to their will. Were you, were you witnessing? Something? I was witnessing, my brother was with me, he was four years younger than me. We were forced to stand on the sidewalk and watch in the plazas how they were hanging innocent Jews. And, and this, can you imagine the impression this does on a 11 year old kid? I mean, I will, could never have really erased it from my memory as long as I live. <laughs> and so then my grandfather, my father's father, that was living with us, Lodge. He was a wonderful, tall Jewish man. He was very religious. He had a long gray beard. He must have been in his, like 60, 62 or something like that, I, I assume. And they grabbed him when he was going home from shul in the middle of the street. They didn't cut his beard. They tore his beard off his face. And when he came home bloody and horrible situation, and barely walking, I saw my grandfather in this condition, and the picture will never be erased from my mind. David, as a as a teenager, basically, uh, how did you mentally cope with this? I, I couldn't. I couldn't wrap this around my head why this is happening. I couldn't understand why the Jewish people were the only ones chosen for no other crime just because they are Jews. And I never understood that being Jewish is a crime. So I could not wrap it around my head. I couldn't understand that anti-Semitism is a viral disease. 
that anti-Semitism does not have a foundation of reason. Anti-Semitism is a, an expression of a deep uh, inbred uh, feeling of hate towards the Jewish people. They don't need a reason why they're anti-Semitic. This is what it is. You're Jewish, you have to be hated. And so I lived in this atmosphere, but it was never overt like this. It was never given expression this way, you know, like Hitler did. But underneath the surface, yes, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Jews were not allowed to go to universities at will because they had a quota that they were restricted. Uh, if you want to go to medical school, and you do even this is before the war, uh, there was a, a quota for that. You could not just become a doctor if you wanted to. Uh, only so, as X amount of Jews would be admitted yearly to, uh, to the bar to, to, to become a lawyer. And so uh, the Jews were very, very restricted in their uh, life in Poland as well. But like I said, <laughs> we learned how to circumnavigate this situation and make the best of it. Uh, so we relied on each other. And so when Hitler came in and the pogroms and the uh, devastation and the persecution started in an over manner. And then of course the ghettos were erected and we were thrown into the ghetto of Strykov where my father had a factory. And oh, so hold, hold on, <laughs> I'm gonna ask questions because it's very important for me to understand. At this point, this is the Einsgruppen soldier, the German soldiers that were getting into Lodz, or you had also Polish soldiers that controlled the Jews. No. The Polish oh. soldiers, the Polish soldiers had no uh, no uh, role whatsoever because they, like I said, militarily Poland crumbled in two weeks, totally defeated. Okay, totally, and so the Germans occupied Poland very quickly. Okay, within days. And I saw the occupation come again with the thousands and thousands of tanks and uh, half tracks and, and cannons and, and artillery and a motor, motorcycle, uh, you know, brigades. Uh, I mean, armed to the teeth, I saw all this. Uh, so the, the Polish military were totally defeated, but the Poles themselves, the civilian population showed an incredible willingness to collaborate and cooperate when it came to the devastation of the Jews. The Poles, the anti-Semitism came to the fore in a big, big way. And I witnessed and I saw with my own eyes how former neighbors and schoolmates and people that we knew for years and even partners in business and all these people that we were acquainted with Many of them were going from door to door with the German soldiers and pointing out there who lives the Jew. There, there is a Jew living. There is a Jew living. And I saw this. They were cooperating. And when the Jewish people were taken out forcibly from their homes and they were dispossessed, normally the Poles were given the opportunity to occupy those homes and take over everything. So at okay. what stage, what year are you forced to leave your home and go to the ghetto. Uh, that was in 19, uh, as soon as Germany came in, we were taken away from our home for Lodz and we were taken forcibly to the to Strykov where we had a factory and my father was ordered to uh, put the factory in motion and he was told, you are no longer the owner of the factory. The factory belongs to the German Reich now and you are ordered, you are ordered to work for the German Reich and produce the leather and fur and clothing for the uh, German military. And that is what we were forced to do. And so they throw us to the ghetto of Strykov. And in Strykov, we had to work for two years like that under horrendous circumstances. So 98 members of your family were deported to the ghetto. Not necessarily in, in the ghetto. They were deported in different parts of, uh, of Poland. There, there are many, many concentration camps and there were uh, many extermination camps. You know, the, the men and the women were separated and they were the first victims, the women and the children. And the 
the older people uh, that they, the Germans, considered now no longer able-bodied or dead wood, as it were, uh, they just eliminated them and burned them in, in, in those concentration camps. Treblinka. So who came with you? Who stayed with you uh, together? Okay, so in the ghetto and lodge, uh, my father was already taken away from us in Strykov when they were separating the people that closed the, the ghetto Strykov and all the able-bodied people were thrown in into the lodge ghetto, which is already fully established, okay? And so they had an industry going there as well. And so they, we, found, we found ourselves inside the lodge ghetto, my mom, my brother, myself, and my grandma. We found ourselves in the lodge ghetto. All the other family members, they were scattered throughout. Okay, I had an uncle and a, uh, on my father's side that also lived in the ghetto with his family. Uh, and um, then I had um, an aunt, uh, my mother's oldest sister and one son, she also lived in the ghetto. But uh, ultimately, the ghetto experienced many raids by the Germans to, over time. And in those raids, there were selections and they were separating the people, the mothers from the children and the, the, from the fathers and the men separately, the women separately, and those that were not able-bodied, as they did, didn't consider them able-bodied, whether too young, too old, too frail, or too, uh, you know, un unable to work, maybe. <coughs> those, I don't know what that is, but anyway, those people, they were, um, they were separated and they were thrown into uh, concentration camps or eliminated altogether. So the only one in the Lodge ghetto was me, my mom, and my brother, and my grandma. Okay. So tell, us, tell us a little bit about the ghetto, because I want to understand where do you live? What do you eat? Do you have a shower? Do you don't have a shower? What are the, the, the conditions? Okay, in the, ghetto, in the ghetto and Lodge, we were assigned by the authorities that were established, or the Jewish authorities. We were assigned a place where to live. And we had to share an apartment with another family. It was very, very tight and very uncomfortable. We didn't know that family at first. We got to know them once we lived there. And so this was the place where we were assigned to live. And my mother was assigned to live to work in a factory. I was assigned uh, at that point, I was like uh, 12 or 13 years old. I was assigned uh, to work uh, in, a, in, a, in a factory in the, in the Loja Ghetto. They converted the largest hospital in the city uh, a four-story massive building into a manufacturing uh, plant of uh, manufacturing clothing, clothing manufacturing. And so thousands of people were employed there and I was one of them. And my uncle, my, my father's oldest brother, uh, Charlie, he was in charge of that entire factory. And so consequently he took me on these wings and he taught me how to become a tailor. My mother pleaded with him, Charlie do something he doesn't have a father anymore. He cannot go to school anymore. My boy needs to uh, have something uh, to rely on, on himself, to learn a trade or something. And so my uncle took me on these wings. He taught me within two years in the ghetto working there in that factory to become a full-fledged tailor. And I did. And that saved my life in the war, believe it or not, that knowledge, that skill. And so consequently, uh, so we stayed in the ghetto for two years, from 1942 uh, to 1944, when they eliminated the Lodge Ghetto. And when they eliminated the Lodge Ghetto, after a tremendous two years of mayhem, you know, when I discovered that they took my mom and way and my brother in the Lodge Ghetto and I was all alone, I became despondent and I became suicidal and I wanted to really take my life and just end it all. And so I went up one day um, uh, on the third story, uh, attic in an abandoned building in the ghetto. I tried to pry open a window and throw myself down and end my life because it wasn't worth living. I had anybody, I had nobody left. In 1942, my mom was taken away, my brother was taken away, my father was taken away before then, and I became an orphan at 14, and my whole world collapsed on me, okay, when I realized what happened. And I didn't want to live. I, I had nothing to live for. If it wasn't for my oldest and that also lived together with her son. And she saved my life by not letting me. She grabbed me by the scruff of my neck when she realized what I'm trying to do. And she pulled me back and she says, yeah, I'm not gonna let you do it. She says, if you lose hope, 
that's all that's all over then you have nothing else left you cannot lose hope you have to stay with us we will be a family me my son and you the three of us and we will make the best we can of each day and we will hope that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday maybe but there's a cannot afford to lose, lose hope there's a very famous <laughs> story that you tell that you always about you um sneaking out of the ghetto to find food and going yes. to this basically to this um field full of potatoes yes yes, yes. i wrote a book i wrote a little bit about this um about this. i wrote i wrote a book about it uh, about my experiences and the the pace of the book the the the, the caption of the book the the, the the jacket shows exactly the illustration of a german soldier holding a gun against my head and i'm trying to steal some potatoes from a field uh, from outside the ghetto and and that, that is that is one instance where i took the life of my own hands that's how desperate i was because we were on the verge of dying from starvation literally literally in the ghetto and myself as well as my aunt and her son we were on the verge of perishing because of hunger that's how strong that hunger was and so i decided one day and I, I must have been at that time like close to 15 years old i was emaciated i was very small and very skinny and i decided not to tell anybody anything and i found in an abandoned building a, 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 a torn burlap sack and i took that sack in the middle of the night to the outskirts of the ghetto where the barbed wire was and the right, right on the other side of that barbed wire there were tremendous fields that were growing potatoes and vegetables and all kinds of things to eat and i wanted to steal some of that so that we could take it home and and save our lives at the, for the time being and i was so daring i dug the hole because the earth at that point where the field started was tilled recently and so it was soft and so with my bare hands i dug a hole deep enough underneath the barbed wire and i snuck underneath in the middle of the night and i started filling in Uh, in that sack with, with the vegetables the potatoes that I uh, were all over there and and I was caught I was caught by the German guard and uh, all of a sudden in the middle of the night a reflector came upon me and I found myself a soldier with a machine gun at my head for flug da mal was machst du denn hier he told me in german god damn it what are you doing here and who are you and so I told him I started pleading with him I was a kid I was like 14 or 15 years old at that time and i i was pleading for my life please don't shoot me i says i'm trying to save the life of my parents and myself we are starving to death all of us i'm just trying to take a few potatoes with me to save our lives please let me go please i'm never going to show up here again i pleaded with him and then i looked at him and he was an older man he could have been my grandfather because i realized later on much later on that the, the germans employed only older germans as guards in those concentration camps and those ghettos because the younger germans had to go to the fight the front in stalingrad leningrad so he was an old man and i spoke to his conscience as is maybe maybe you have a grandson just like me i said wouldn't you consider just letting me go you know this is a, a something i'm i promise never to be here again i'll try to plead for my life and to my surprise to my great surprise <laughs> He lowered his rifle. He turns off the reflector, and he tells me to get the hell out of here and take the potatoes with me. Okay, and I don't ever want to see you here again. He said in German to me, "If I see you again, I'll shoot you on the spot." And so I ran and back to the ghetto with the potatoes, and I had a hell of a time with it because uh, I was afraid, first of all, to be seen by anyone. Uh, in the middle of the night, if I'm being spotted, I'm going to be lynched. and my potatoes will be taken away from me because everybody in the ghetto was starving everybody was fighting for their life uh, of starvation and so David. this is what happened david it's a, it's a, it's an insane story it's un, un i took the life in my own hands it, you 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 were just it's it's just un, un I, it's not padded up i can yeah it's, i i cannot even digest what you with i'm padded up that other I, than this potato story which is what did you guys eat how did you guys survive day to day what 
I mean, there's well, the they, 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 were, they were giving, they were giving, see, see the people in the ghetto had to work. They, they were industries there, they had to work. And because they had to work, they had to be fed. So they were giving us rations, but those rations were calculated to be so uh, under nourishing, under the norm that you know, so much less than people need for a day existence, that we were constantly, constantly hungry and constantly starving. And I witnessed daily, on a daily basis, people dying on the streets, literally, literally, children with swollen bellies dying on the streets. And people were walking by and they're watching this and nobody bent down to see if they can help their child because no one, no one had any feelings left alive in them. Everybody was so dehumanized that all people could think of, how do I survive the next hour, the next day, okay? The, the, the power of, of um, self-preservation was so completely over, overtaken, people were so overtaken by it, that all they could think of is how do I get a piece of something to in my mouth so that I don't die from starvation. <laughs> and so in this circumstance, under so long, such a long time of, of treatment like this, the people became totally dehumanized, okay? There was no pity left, there was no compassion left. We, it was a luxury. To have pity and compassion was a tremendous luxury. We couldn't afford it. We didn't have it anymore, okay? Everybody was like dead inside. And under those circumstances, I, I took the life of my own hands and I was stealing potatoes from a, a field that belonged to a, a pole, to a Christian pole, you know. And, so did, uh, it happen, did it happen only once or you did it over and over again? No, no, no. I didn't dare to go there back again because I knew that if I do, I'm going to be shot. I, I just knew it. I, I, there was a squirk and I was lucky uh, that the, the German uh, had some, some compassion and let me go. But I can tell you, this could not repeat itself. I didn't want to take another chance. I couldn't. And so then the ghetto was eliminated in, in 1944, after two years of, of this kind of uh, existence. And uh, whoever was still alive was taken away uh, from the ghetto to Auschwitz. Uh, I was hiding out in the ghetto for two weeks, trying to uh, hope that the, the Russian army is going to liberate me because the, I could hear in the ghetto the reverberations of the cannons and the tanks. The front was very near. Actually, <laughs> the Russians were even they were on the bank of the Vistula River in Warsaw already, going, marching forward, okay? And, and I figured within days, they will be here and they will liberate me and I will not have to report to go to Germany proper uh, because that's what they want us to do. So they took all those that were going away, that were told to report to the substation to be taken away and the ghetto was emptied out and I was alone in the ghetto for two weeks. And after two weeks, I couldn't function anymore because I was scavenging at night to sustain myself. And then uh, in the end, I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. There was nothing else to scavenge. And um, so I, I joined a, a group that I saw on, outside my window one day uh, sweeping up the sidewalks. And I joined them to give me a broom. I said, I'll be one of you because I just could not sustain myself being in hiding anymore. And so I joined them and, and we were taken away. And we were told at that time that we were taken to Germany proper, but we were not, we were taken to Auschwitz. And when I realized that, that I'm- you know, I didn't Okay, go. so wait, wait, at, at this point, what is your knowledge outside of the ghetto? What do you know about the war? What do you know about Auschwitz? What do you know about other places? <laughs> knowledge. Okay, so you need to understand something. <laughs> the Jews were deliberately kept in the dark throughout the war, okay? We had no radio, we had no newspapers, we had no news source of any kind. We had no idea what is happening all around us, absolutely not. We were hermetically closed in ghettos. And so I had no idea what Auschwitz was, never heard even the word Auschwitz. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> so when the, when the train finally opened after many, many, days of journeying like that in great misery, and some people died inside those trains. And when we finally got out on the tarmac, and I thought it was in Germany because that's what they originally told us that we we're going. And then I, 
I said, and I saw this sight, the frightening sight of so many uh, German SS soldiers with, with the German shepherds, the teeth ready to devour us and barking and, and, and screaming at the people that uh, to get out of the, of the wagons. Raus, Juden, raus, raus, you and they were chasing us and beating us on the way. And then there was a whole contingent uh, of prisoners with striped clothing. And, and I, I go down and I look around, I don't know where I am. And, and I approach one of those prisoners next to me. And I say, excuse me, but am I in Germany? He says, no, you're in Auschwitz. And I had no idea what Auschwitz was at that point. So I said, what is Auschwitz? So he says, turn around. So I turned around. He said, you see that big chimney rising up in there with the black smoke coming out of it? I said, I see it, but what about it? He says, that's where you wound up. And I looked at them like a madman speaking. I said, I, this man is insane. He doesn't know what he's talking about. What do you mean I'm not gonna wind up in the, in the chimney in the black smoke? Why, why would I wind up there? I had no idea what is happening. I had no idea about crematoria at that point. And so before we knew what was going on, they gathered us together, put us on trucks, and took us to the camp itself. And I wound up in Auschwitz. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The and, fact that you were, uh, you, were like, you were 15 back then? Yeah. And in Auschwitz, um, uh, I, uh, that was the 1944. Uh, okay. And in Auschwitz, um, uh, I, I, I realized very, very quickly uh, what is happening. There are 24 7 raids on all of the entire camp, uh, sifting through the able-bodied from the ones that they consider not able-bodied. And those that are considered no longer able-bodied, they are taken away and being burned in the crematoria. Those that they consider able-bodied still, they are let, letting stay in Auschwitz proper and joining work gangs every day on different assignments. David, where, where did you sleep? Did you sleep in a barrack? In, a, in your own bed or well, we, we, bed were, we were in the barracks we were like sardines squeezed in like we were like 10 people in one little bunk you're like uh, like sardines uh, squeezed in and uh, and and you know I, I couldn't sleep I, I there was nothing in the, <laughs> and the food was so meager we were always always starving and so uh, in Auschwitz I realized that the uh, when there is a constant 24 7 selection of people uh, and they have they don't and i asked the, the guys that were there before me i said do they go by some kind of a list some kind of a system uh, any names uh, how do they choose people which one is and which one he says no no everything is random they told me everything is just random on the, on the spur of the moment so i figured well if it's random i can be next or i have no assurance that i won't be the next one to, to be chosen, uh, to be killed. And so I was very despondent and very desperate to get out of Auschwitz. And um, I used all my wits, I used all my cunning, I used all my street smarts that I uh, accumulated over uh, those days, those years in the ghettos uh, to, to find a way of how to get out of Auschwitz. You cannot just walk out of Auschwitz. No. Auschwitz was a hermetically closed prison that has nothing like it at all. And so there were electric wires uh, surrounding the camp. You touch them, you die. And a lot of people did. <laughs> but uh, uh, one day I was just milling around in you know, the beginning of my being there, a few days I was milling around the courtyard and, and I saw a long line of people lined up and men. And I um, uh, asked uh, one of the guy at the end of the line, I says, uh, are you here for food? He says, no, uh, we are here to be taken to Germany proper to work as laborers in the, in the building industry. I says, what kind of workers are they looking for? And they said, they're looking for, for workers in the building industry, the bricklayers, uh, cement layer workers, uh, metal workers, uh, you know, architects, engineers, things like that, people in the building in the industry. And I says, and I said to myself, I'm none of those. I'm a tailor. They don't need me. And I'm 15 years old. And, and so I decided to go into the line and tell him a lot, create a lie uh, for the guy in front that makes the selection and tell him that I'm in the building trade. So when my turn came, he looked at me and started laughing in my face. And he says, who, who, 
what the hell are you doing here? You're a kid. We, you still got your, your mother's milk on your lips. I said, sir, I'm a carpenter. I said to him, like hell you're a carpenter. He says, get the hell out of here. And he just throws me out from the line back into the camp. I don't ever want to see you here again. And so when I came out, I realized I missed an opportunity. So how do I be taken away from this goddamn camp in Auschwitz to Germany proper? At least I'll be working, whatever it is, but I'll be, I won't be dead maybe. <laughs> and so I, I made the decision. I talked to myself. Look, I says, everybody looks the same. Everybody's clean shaven. Everybody has got bad fitting striped clothing. Everybody is a clone to the next person after such a treatment. If I would see my brother next to me, I wouldn't recognize him because I figured out there are no circumstances. If I go back in line and, and you know try to get, get past, maybe he won't recognize me. And so I took a chance. <laughs> and when he saw me, the minute he saw me, he recognized me. It was Mengele himself. I didn't know it was Bengal himself, but that's how I found out. And how, he, did he, how did he look? What, what did he? Oh my God! He he was a, actually he was smiling. He was he was murdering people while he was smiling. Okay, he was uh, making selections of life and death while he was having a good time with it. I mean, he was a regular soldier like most officers, you know, are. And uh, you could, I could not know that this man has such a high rank or something like that. <laughs> but this is what he did. He made the selections. Was he standing there with his uh, helpers? He was standing there and you know, people saw him in long lines and, he, and they were appearing before him. And everyone that appeared, he either showed you with the finger to go to the left, to the right or to the left. And if you go, if you're chosen to go to the left, you're going to be burned and taken away and, and disposed of. And you go to the right, you go back to camp to work. Okay, so, uh, I um, was 15 years old, and I, when, when he saw me, he started laughing in my face and he told me, Did I, I just saw you here before, didn't I? And I said, sir, uh, I'm a carpenter. And he says, no, you are not. Get the hell out of here. And if I see you one more time, he said, I'll kill you right here and now. And I knew he meant it. And I knew he meant it. So I didn't go back the, the, the third time. But I wanted so desperately to escape Auschwitz. I, I was just aching to get out this hell of a, of, a, of a place. And so I saw the next day, uh, two guys, uh, big burly guys uh, with a big heavy pole suspended one end of, on, on the shoulder of this one in the front, the one in the back had the other end of, and in the middle was a big, huge bucket of soup, I guess. And so I approached this guy and I said, excuse me, but what are you doing? Where are you going? What's going on here? And he said to me, uh, we just came from the kitchen uh, to take the soup over to the holding area. They selected 200 men to go to work to Germany, okay, from the camp. And they were selected already and also fenced around uh, so nobody can get in or out. And so, but we are taking the soup in. And when I heard that, it was like a light bumping up in my head. And I said, oh my God, this is my chance. I put my shoulder in front of this guy the last guy, and I says, we are going to be the three of us taking the soup to that holding area. And he says, no, 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 you can't do it. They only know that there are two of us. You can't do it. You put us all in jeopardy. I said, listen, shut up. Let me walk, because if you don't, we're all going to be in trouble, including you. So just be quiet and let me just walk. And so I intimidated him, and he was gritting his teeth and let me walk, and we walked all three into the holding area. The minute they put down the bucket of soup, I disappeared in the crowd. I totally disappeared. I didn't want to be seen or heard or, or even known in any way. I, I, died, I dared, I didn't dare to breathe hardly. <laughs> I, was, I was scared. I was here, you know, on false pretenses. I, I didn't belong there. I wasn't selected, but I was there among the crowd. Wow. And we were waiting. We, the soup was dealt out. Uh, the people were given their rations. Uh, and I was waiting just for the train to arrive. After many hours, the train finally did arrive, and I was the very first person on that train, the very first one. But the Germans, they had, they were so meticulous about everything, Pünktlichkeit, the Deutsche Pünktlichkeit, you know, the German punctuality. They knew exactly how many heads were counted to, to go to, to, to Germany to work, and so they knew there were 200 men. 
And so they were counting as we were going in. I swipe, drive here, film sick, you know, everybody, one, two, three, four. And by the time the 200 person was counted, the doors closed. I was inside the wagon. And um, I hear a man on the outside screaming, yelling, and protesting. But I was selected. I was selected. I, why don't you take me? I was selected. It was this man whose place I took wow. okay, to save my life. Wow. And I don't know who that man was or how he looked like or what his name was. I have no idea. All I know, I saved my life by taking the place of the man that was selected. And let me tell you something. I had no regrets. I had no pity. I had no second thoughts, whether I did anything right or wrong. All I know, I was aching to save my life. And I did. Hopefully, I did. I didn't know yeah, that. Because, because you didn't know where this train going to take you to. No. All I knew that this train is going to Germany. That's, yeah, but but that's what I told you. You were going to us. No. Actually, it did go to Germany. It went to the to Bavaria, to the city of uh, Landsberg, uh, and then from Landsberg it went to uh, uh, Kaufering. Uh, you know, uh, and actually, uh, when we were unloaded, eventually after many, many, many days of travel under horrendous circumstances in those cattle cars, <laughs> when the wagons, when the doors open, flung open, and we found ourselves in open fields. And we saw no city or anything, just open fields. Did people it, jump from the train? Did people escape from the train, jump out? Or no, 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 no. The train stopped with all the, we had a lot of guards around us, the German guards, the guarding us. Okay. And when the, the train stopped, we were selected to work, to work, actually work, do work there. Right. You know? <laughs> so, so when the train stopped, you know where, where they took us? They took us to the horrendous concentration camp called Dachau. And so I wound up in Dachau, along with all the other in the train. And they transported us to Dachau, they deloused us. We had to take cold showers. They gave us new bed fitting, ill-fitting strap clothing, ill-fitting shoes, that those shoes were taken from other murdered victims, Jewish victims. And, and they processed us and we had to sign a form, okay? We had to sign a form that all the information we give in the form, like the date of birth and the place where we come from and all that, that all is true and correct by the by penalty of death if we if we don't tell the truth, okay? And we had to sign for that. And on that form, when I had to write my date of birth, I was immediately, immediately thinking of a way how to make myself older. Because if you are older, you have a greater chance of survival as an able-bodied person. If you are too young, you may not have that chance. So I made myself two years older than I actually am on that form. And that form was retrieved about a few months ago uh, through research uh, from the archives. And I have that wow, access. You have that, that form. form. Pardon me? You have that form. I have that form. I have that access on that form, yes. David, do you have the photo of you in this black and white photo? Uh, when you are just liberated, I think you have a photo of you in. Poland. Yes, I have. I have. Uh, yeah, I, I. In my book, uh, I have all these photos. You know, uh, where after liberation, you know, during yes. the war, during the war, I have no photos of myself. During the, for, for, yeah, of course, after liberation. I mean. After liberation, yeah. So I was liberated, of course, 1945. And what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, uh, when we were taken to. Uh, Dachau and process and the allows uh, we were taken to uh, in the beginning to work in gangs you know to work on bombed out railroad tracks to repair those and and work with the uh, building underground bunkers you know and all these terrible horrible hard labor and, um, and from there they made uh, a selection of a certain amount of people maybe 200 or so and uh, <laughs> and they shipped them off they shipped them off, including myself, to a subcamp of Dachau called Kaufering. Okay, Kaufering was a cluster of camp for men and women, and uh, and that a separate subcamp. And I lived and worked and almost died in that camp uh, for 
about a year, almost a year, because from 1944, in the beginning where we were taken till the end of 44, right into spring of 45, I was in that camp. That camp in Kaufering became not just a labor camp, but it became an epidemics camp. The people got so sick with so many diseases that it became an epidemics camp. And so people were dying, it seems to me like by the hundreds. And, and they were burning the corpses in, in graves out just outside the camp in, in huge ditches, you know, that they were piling up the, the corpses and burning them. And this is how they would dispose of the body. So in that- they, camp, make, you, did they make you do that, take the oh, body? They, yeah, they, make, they make you uh, drag those bodies, sure, and to the grave sites or, you know, on, onto carts, you know. And, all these things were I experienced in those in those camps, in those labor camps. My life was hanging constantly on a hair. I was young, and I was uh, not that strong anymore. Uh, but evidently, I must have had some kind of strong immunity in my body that enabled me to overcome all. I was, soul, very, maybe. I was very sick. Yeah, I, was, I was very sick at that time. At that time, uh, uh, around the uh, you know, spring, early spring, 1945, I was like 17 years old. And, um, uh, and I uh, survived all the disease and everything else. We were taken away eventually because when the allies start encroaching, they're coming in to occupy Germany from all sides. The Germans panicked and they tried to eliminate the camps in the south and, and transport the able-bodied men and women to the north, to Bergen-Belsen, okay? Another infamous came. And so uh, they took us away, they closed the camp, and uh, they, whoever still remained alive, they were putting into cattle cars again and transporting north to bergen -Belsen. On the way, on the way, uh, the trains stopped in a thick forest in Bavaria and did not go forth and did not go back. It just stopped cold and nobody knew why. And so, after a little while, another train came from the opposite side, also in, the, in that very forest, and also stopped right across from us. That other train was a purely military train with aircraft cannons sticking out from it, camouflage, and the soldiers brimming with soldiers. And, and there, yeah, two trains standing there in the middle of, of the forest in 1945 or the early spring, okay? And um, and doesn't go anywhere and nobody tells us anything. And before we knew what was going on, before we knew what was going on, don't forget we lived, we were a couple cars, all the prisoners in the train, no roof, okay? Before we knew what was happening, we hear, we hear a, a tremendous roar uh, on the horizon. And, and I don't know where it came from because I, I was unfamiliar with the sound at that time. What had happened it was an armada of American attack plane. Ameri they were already in Germany. American attack planes saw the military train in that forest, okay? And they were getting to that military train. And then when they saw the, the other train uh, where we were, they thought that both of them were military trains. And so they attacked both trains from the air with machine guns. And so many of our people died at that, at, at that attack by American forces. Okay, the Americans had no idea that one train is full of prisoners and the other one is full of military. They had no idea. And so they attacked both planes, set them on fire, set the locomotives on fire. Everything was aflame. And when, and when they were trying to make those rounds for another attack and another attack, I realized that I may not survive this because all, everything in front of me were like dead people, you know, they were all machine gun. And so I said to my two friends that survived still with me to jump over into the forest, jump over, save your life. So we did, we jumped over. And the Germans threatened to kill us if we jumped, but they jumped the first one. So we wound up all in the forest. In the forest, eventually they realized, eventually David, the pilots realized they made a mistake and they stopped the, the attack. David, was this uh, winter or? No, no, that was early spring. That was early spring, and like, like maybe, uh, I guess, end of March, something like that. Okay. Beginning of April. And uh, it was cold in the forest. We stayed in the forest for three days and three nights. And um, 
you know, and, and the guards were all over the place, guarding us, telling us not to move, not to move, stay in place, stay in place. But they didn't feed us, they didn't give us anything. And, and, and people were really in bad, 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 bad shape. And so after the third night in the forest, listen to this, they wake up in the morning and they hear loud voices of our own people screaming at us. The, the elder ones among us was yelling to everybody else, hey guys, there are no Germans left. Wow. We, are, we are alone in the forest. They're gone. They're all gone overnight. They're just gone, all of them. And, and, and we didn't understand what was happening because we didn't know that the war is so close to an end at that point. But it was. They knew it. And so they prepared civilian clothing, evidently, in their train. And they shed their military uniforms overnight. And they put on civilian clothing and left and disappeared in, 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 into the population and left us alone in the forest. And at that point, we didn't know what to do. So the first thing we realized that we are alone and we are abandoned, we raided the military train because it was standing there, in a plane. So we raided that train and boy, did we find a lot of food there. Oh my God, but they were all canned food and they were heavy food. There was pork and beans and all kinds of heavy military rations. But we were just so starved. We were trying to open those cans. We had no opener. And so we were banging the, the, the cans into any hard surface that we could find to open, pry it open. Most of us did not succeed, but some of us did. And those that did, those that did, they died after two days. They died. They died, yeah, after two days. They, they could not process. They wow. could not process the food that, there was, that they were gorging themselves on because their body was so emaciated, it was impossible to digest. They died from it, it was poison to them. What I happened lucky, to you? What did I you? Was lucky, I was lucky I couldn't open the can. I had cans and I couldn't open them and my friends couldn't either. So I did, we decided to take the cans with us, open it at another time and that saved our life. And so eventually we split up we realized there is nobody to guard us. We split up, we didn't know what to do or where we are and to head out in the countryside and to look for somebody to talk to, to give us some directions what to do next. And so the three of us are walking uh, on the meadows uh, of Germany and looking towards finding some civilization. And then eventually after about a half an hour or so of walk, we discovered a, like a roof outline in the horizon and we walked towards that that part, that place. And then when we came close, we realized we are walking in, in a hornet's nest. In a what? In a hornet's nest. We were full of military. Excuse me, let me just, let me just answer that. Hello, Gabriela. Honey, I cannot talk to you. I'm in the middle of the webinar right now. Okay, I'll talk to you later, okay? Thank you. Thank you. I'll call you back. Okay. So uh, that is exactly what happened. And um, and, uh, and uh, we were taken in by the soldiers. They said that we cannot stay there. This is a military area, they said. In, in German, they told me, because I was the only one speaking German. Uh, so they told me, this is a military area. In German, this is a military area. You cannot remain here. I said, sir, what do you suggest we do? And so he took us into the, to the actual house of the, of the farm, the farmhouse. And there was a huge, very heavy set military official that was full of medals all over the place. I mean, it must have been some kind of a general or something. <coughs> very menacing, menacing looking. And he looks at uh, us three boys and he asks us the same question. He says, Wir sind Sie denn? Was passen denn hier? Who are you or what are you doing here? And so I explained to him what happened. We were abandoned by the military and uh, we didn't know what to do. So we are looking for someone to talk to. Hey, so you can't bleiben. You can't remain here. You have to leave and go back where you came from. So we did. We start walking back. And as we walk back, about a half, 15 minutes and walk back, I could hear a civilian man, uh, older man's voice in German screaming at us from afar and running towards us. 
Burschen, Burschen, bleib stehen, bleib stehen, geht nicht weg, der Kuli. Ich wollte mit euch sprechen. Boy, boys, don't, don't go any further. Stop right there. I want to come to talk to you. So he, he comes closer and he says to me in German, he says to, uh, to us, to three boys, he says, listen, I am the farmer of that, of that farm. I'm the owner of that farm. The German military is leaving momentarily. The war is coming to an end. You are coming with me into my farm. I'm going to accommodate you. I'm going to put you up. And so we stayed on that farm. The military left after a few minutes. We stayed on the farm for about two days, okay? They gave us food, they gave us clothing, they enabled us to take a shower on the outside. And after two days, the American forces arrived at that area. And uh, all of a sudden we were confronted by many American tanks and American soldiers, like a whole battalion of black American soldiers appeared in front of me and my two friends. And I had never seen an American soldier before and we certainly never saw a, a live black person before in Europe they didn't we didn't see them uh, and so they tried to communicate with us frantically frantically and uh, and I I couldn't talk English at that time I spoke Polish I spoke Yiddish I, I spoke German but I speak I didn't speak English and they speak only English and so there was a little a lot of frustration between them and us and so uh, you know amid all this frustration in the middle of the column, from the middle of the column, a big, tall, slanky, white officer appears, comes straight towards us, three boys, and he says to us in unadulterated Yiddish, he says to us, isn't even in Yiddish. He said, you boys, are you Jewish? And I was like, my jaw flung open. I was like, flabbergasted. I said, this man speaks Yiddish, a perfect Yiddish. I said, wait a minute. I says, you are an American officer, American soldier. How come you speak such a Yiddish? And he looks at me and he says, I'm from Brooklyn. Oh my God. I had no idea what Brooklyn was. As far as I'm concerned, it could have been Madagascar. You know, I had no idea. But anyway, so that's what he said. And he took me under his wings, me and my two friends. He said, you are not going to remain here. The war is coming to an end. The American forces occupied Germany. Germany capitulated. Uh, and uh, you are coming with me. And he took us to a, um, an American run displaced persons camp nearby in the next city of Feldafink. And there he put us up and we were taken care of by the people that, uh, in that camp. And um, uh, we were really treated beautifully. Uh, we were provided for, we were given medical care, we were given several three times a day food and and we were giving you clothing and underwear and everything. we were all of a sudden feeling like we are human beings again in no time at all i mean you know the, the war came to an end and this is how it ended for me wow david this is i mean look i could i could speak hours and hours with you and i probably will we'll meet in our in in my house for dinner and you know you'll meet my family and i want i want to hear more but I just want to, you know, thank you so much for sharing this. I don't know. I don't know if I can call it a story. It's more than a story. It's 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 history, you know. And it's it's about survival. It's about it's about tenacity. It's about it's about so many things. And and you were only a kid, you know. You were only a kid when the war ended. I was seventeen years old. Losing all your family members, yeah, and not knowing. As a matter of fact, they are. For the longest time, I thought I was the only one in the world left in my family. But then later, I discovered that my dad was alive. Yeah, uh, but uh, that's a different story altogether. But anyway, for uh, people, for people who wants to read your book, yes, Let me, how can how can hold, they? Why hold, don't you bring the book? And, hold on, yeah. hold on one second. I'll go show you the book. Hold on one second. Okay, so, so this is the book, The Compassion of a Deadly Enemy. The enemy. And there, can you see the kid stealing potatoes and the soldier having a rifle at his yeah. hand? Where we can get it? Can we get it online? You can get it from Amazon, Amazon. Just Amazon Books. Click in the Compassion of a Deadly Enemy and David Lenga. 
and immediately uh, my site comes up and you can uh, have it there through amazonbooks.com. Okay, okay. I will, I will also post it on my Facebook and my Instagram and-, and Thank you, thank you very much. Foundation. We'll do the same. Uh, it is, it is, uh, uh, it is you, can, you, can, you can tell your entire life story in one hour, but- No, but no, what, you cannot. I, this was actually put in a nutshell, what I yeah. was telling you. Uh, yeah. I was going to condense six years of hell into a few uh, precious uh, minutes. Exactly. So, so I, I did my best, but I can tell you this, uh, what I went through, okay, uh, must be, must be considered as a microcosm of, you need to multiply stories like that six million times for six million victims that went through the Holocaust and perished. I was one of the few, very few lucky ones to survive. And I cannot tell you that I survived because of divine will. I cannot say that. I just cannot say that, okay? But I can tell you that I think I, I, I survived by my sheer will of survival, my resilience, and my cunning, if you will. And also, 90% of it, was luck, sheer, sheer, pure luck. Because at any given moment during that entire time of suffering, I could have lost my life, okay? And um, I took many chances and uh, I made it through, but many, 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 many people did not, okay? So um, when you go through this kind of a trauma, and you still come out a whole person. It is a miracle. In my view, this is a pure miracle because no regular, normal human being can be subjected to this kind of horror and come out a whole person because it works on your psyche, it works on your soul, it leaves scars in your in, in your heart. You become a very damaged human being, okay? And so many of my friends that are survivors are equally damaged human beings, okay? And um, I was married to my wonderful wife that I met after the war in Sweden because from Germany went to Sweden. And she was also a Holocaust survivor. And she went through tremendous trauma, much more so than me after the war. She could not, shake it of what happened to her, okay? And she was in therapy for years. And um, eventually, after many, many years, uh, she made a trip with some friends of hers to revisit her hometown and to revisit Auschwitz and Krakow and all the concentration camp. And that put an end to her suffering, I guess, because she, she was able to close the book. Okay. What about you? Did you go back? I, I never went back to Auschwitz for 71 years. I made a vow after the war. I will not ever go back to Poland. And I will not get over the threshold of Poland, step over it, ever. Because Poland to me represented as an earth that is drenched in Jewish blood and tragedy. It is drenched in murder and mayhem of the Jewish people. It is drenched in the murder of my own family. And everything that I held dear, everything that meant something to me in my life, everything that was a good memory turned into ashes in my own lifetime in Lodge, seeing it all happening in front of my eyes. So what am I going back to after the war? I didn't want to go back to. But my father, who survived the war against all odds, I mean, this man is a miracle in itself that he survived the war. When the war ended, my father was only 44 years old. He was a young man. He was only 44 years old. So he got still a life ahead of him. But how he survived the war is beyond me. And they, they mistreated him. He broke three ribs in the concentration camps for him. But he still survived the war. And he lived to a ripe old age, almost he died in Israel at the age of almost 90. 
Okay, and I, once I discovered my dad was alive, the two of us out of so many in our family, um, we became inseparable and actually we were separated throughout the years because he was in Israel, I was in America, but I visited him 40 times. Wow. Yeah, and because, you know, every little opportunity I had, I was there visiting my dad. And so um, he made a life for himself in, in Israel and um, he became pretty successful in his own way. Uh, he could not practice his own craft because in the beginning there was no industry or anything. So he embarked on a different line. He became a builder, a kaplan in Israel. And um, as, as such, he did well for himself. So I'm very proud of him. But um, he was almost 90 when he passed away. Yeah. And uh, he and I had a lot of catch up to do. I did not see my dad after the war for 12 years. Why? He was in Israel. I was in uh, Sweden. Okay, I made my life in Sweden. I lived in Sweden for 10 years. I married there. I had my two, uh, older two daughters born in Sweden. And I had a very good life there. And during the time of my living there, in the beginning when I was a refugee, of course, you know, like just a newcomer, I could not afford to travel. First of all, there was no travel availability. You could, only a boat, you know. I couldn't do that. I need to provide for myself and my family. I got married at 18. My wife and I, we got married after three weeks of knowing each other, okay? And uh, she was a beautiful, beautiful young lady. And we made a wonderful life together. We created a wonderful family subsequently. And, um, uh, and I was struggling, once I found out about that, I was struggling to find ways of how to reunite with him. I wanted to come to Israel at that time. You know, my dad first came to Poland to look for me. And in Poland, you know what happened in Poland? He was trying to put his factory back in motion, even though it was a skeleton. It was not, nothing there, everything was stripped. But in a primitive way, he was trying to put it back in motion. And with the native Poles, the Christian Poles, realized that the Jew is coming back from concentration again, trying to become a, a businessman again. They came in the middle of the night with guns drawn to his head and told him, you goddamn Jew, if you don't leave Poland, not just the city, but Poland, by tomorrow, we come back and we kill you. Those anti-Semites, this was after the war. He fled for his life. He fled for his life and he wound up in Israel. Just, just as Israel became independent in 1948. And he remained in Israel for the rest of his life. And so um, this is what happened to him. And that is why during the entire uh, 12 years, we were corresponding with each other by letters, by telephone calls and so forth, but we couldn't see each other. So finally, uh, around 1960, 1953, okay, the war in 1945, 1953, finally I was able to work hard day and night, what I was doing and, provide, and, and buying a ticket for my dad to come and visit me to Sweden. For, at that time, so many things have happened. He left me, I was a 14 year old boy. When he found me again, I was 20, 25, okay? I had married, I had a wife and two children and uh, he remarried also, but I knew about it uh, to a woman that he knew from before the war. And she also had a family with five children that she lost in the Holocaust. So anyway, he came for the first time in 1953 to visit me after our separation in 1942 in the war. I cannot tell you the incredible scene when he and I met and he met my family. I cannot even describe it in words. It was so emotional, we were all crying. And my dad, when he came down from the boat in the middle of the night and I stood there with my wife and children and he looked at me, he, was becoming what we say in Yiddish, totally verklempt. Verklempt means he was nutted up inside. He could not utter a word. He could not speak. He lost his ability to speak. But his tears were constantly flowing and he embraced me. And he embraced my children, his only grandchildren. And, and, and my wife, of course, that he forgot to know for the first time. We went into the taxi from the harbor to come home where I lived during the entire time. 
He could not say one word. All we could do is squeeze our hands. And then the minute we came to our apartment, I opened the door, we started talking. And so there was an awful lot of emotions going on for that we finally got to be reunited in person the first time. And so much has happened in between, okay? And so ever since then, I was with my dad, I mean, all the time. Hello, what happened here? Another loss? Okay. We, no, we're we, here. We're here. Sorry, we don't know what happened to Guy, but we are here. Okay. Well, anyway, I don't see anybody. I, I, oh. I, I just see the sign. Yad Vashem. Yes, but we are still here. Okay. I just want to conclude by saying that after the war, I made a life for myself. I became pretty successful in my own way. Uh, I became a designer. I was working for the movie industry for 15 years. I made a wow. career of my life. And I then later got into real estate and became quite successful there. And so I made a very good life for myself today. Today, my family is numbering seven grandchildren and seven great grandchildren, thank God. And, and we are thriving, all of us here, mostly in California. That's amazing. And I know that you recently, for the first time uh, since COVID began, you were able, you said, to reconnect with your family in person, right? Yes, in person, yeah, the first time. For a long time, for a whole year, we were like locked up in isolation, you know? And uh, now we're breaking out because uh, things are getting better now. Wow. I'm, that was your I'm speaking to many venues. I'm speaking to... Uh, on behalf of two museums in Los Angeles, the Museum wow. of Holocaust uh, and the uh, uh, Museum of Tolerance, the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And have I'm, you been to Yad Vashem in Israel? Uh, I uh, have uh, been at Yad Vashem. I have been at Yad Vashem many times, and actually, my book was printed through Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, I have many connections. I have a lot of family in Israel as well. And so uh, in, in America, uh, I have, uh, as I say, established myself, but after I retired, I became very involved with the Jewish community. I am um, <laughs> speaking widely. Oh, you're back on? Good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm here. I'm sorry. sorry. I was cut off suddenly, so I don't know what happened. I don't know either. Uh, at, at any rate, um, this is what it is. And um, I'm very grateful that I'm at 93 still able to talk to you and still able to have webinars and still able to try to make an impact uh, telling my story to audiences that are totally ignorant about what happened in World War II, ignorant of what happened in the Holocaust, especially the young people. And they need to know, they must know what happened because unless they know, they're on the risk of repeating the same mistake again. And I so- I agree with you. And David, I just wanted to, um, before we getting cut off again. I, I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart to, that you share your stories all over the world and in the US. Uh, I, I and, and you know Yad Vashem, American Society for Yad Vashem will uh, give opportunity uh, uh, for people to see this um, um, talk uh, that is recorded uh, on Facebook and on Instagram and, and on the website and I I just wanted to thank you and I'll see you very, very soon. I thank you so much for taking the time out for this uh, interview and I'm very pleased that I was able to talk to you. You, you are a hero and you are a huge inspiration for all of us. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, thank you. You wish you good luck. Stay safe and, and see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so, so much, David. Bye-bye, Shalom.